Hello, how are you? I hope you are fine, safe, healthy, and have great time learning new knowledge. So far, I have recorded three videos on capital structure, and this video is the fourth video. If you can recall, my first video focused on introduction and overview. In my second video, we have learned about the modi glenny miller theorem in a world without taxes. The value of the levered firm is the same as the value of the unlevered firm. In other words, the choice of the debt equity ratio is unimportant. After that, in my third video, we have learned that in a world with corporate taxes, the value of the firm increases with leverage, implying that firms should take on as much debt as possible. But is this the whole story? Should financial managers really set their firm's debt to equity ratios as high as possible? Near 100%? If so, why do real world companies have rather modest levels of debts? Well, this video will tell you more. This video is the fourth video on capital structure, which will bridge the gap between theory and practice. We will learn that there are good reasons for modest capital structure in practice, even in a world with taxes. We shall begin with the concept of financial distress costs. We will discuss the costs associated with financial distress and its impact on capital structure. Stay tuned and let's learn together. According to Modi, Glenny, and Miller, in the presence of corporate taxes, the value of firm rises with leverage due to the tax benefits of debt. Other authors have suggested that financial distress, bankruptcy, and related costs reduce the value of the levered firm. Therefore, a firm's capital structure decision involves a trade-off between the tax benefits of debt and the cost of financial distress. While financial leverage can serve as a means to increase the return on equity when economic conditions are favorable, a high level of debt can be detrimental in a recession as the firm might be forced to liquidate assets at fire sale prices. Debt puts pressure on the firm because interest and principal payments are obligations. If these obligations are not met, the firm may risk some sort of financial distress. The ultimate distress is bankruptcy. Bankruptcy or financial distress costs can lower the value of the firm. First, we shall discuss the impact of tax effects and financial distress costs on the value of firm. When the cost of financial distress is considered from the pie approach, the cash flows of the firm go to four different claimants. First, shareholders. Second, bondholders. Third, the government in the form of taxes. And fourth, lawyers during the bankruptcy process. As such, the value of the firm VT equals the sum of the following four components. Where S is the value of the equity, B is the value of the bonds, G is the value of the government claims from taxes, and L stands for the value that lawyers and others receive when the firm is under financial distress.
What are the key differences between marketable claims and non-marketable claims? Marketable claims refer to claims of shareholders and bondholders. Marketable claims can be bought and sold in the financial markets. Shareholders and bondholders pay cash for the privilege. On the other hand, non-marketable claims refer to claims of government and potential litigants in lawsuits. Non-marketable claims cannot be bought and sold in the financial markets. The government and lawyers pay nothing for the privilege. The distinction between marketable and non-marketable claims is important. When we speak of the value of the firm, we are referring just to the value of the marketable claims, VM, not the value of non-marketable claims, VN. By the Pi theory, any increase in VM must imply an identical decrease in VN. Rational financial managers will choose a capital structure to maximize the value of VM and minimize the value of VN. This figure shows the relationship between debt and value of firm. The horizontal line, VU, represents the value of firm with no debt. The red line, VL, is the value of firm under Modi, Glenny and Miller theorem with corporate taxes and debt. The distance between VU and VL is the present value of texture. The value of leeward firm is higher than the value of unleeward firm. The red line, V, is the actual value of firm with financial distress costs. The distance between VL and V is the present value of financial distress costs. We can see that the tax shield increases the value of the leeward firm. On the other hand, financial distress costs lower the value of the leeward firm. As a result, the two offsetting factors produce an optimal amount of debt at point B asterisk. With small amount of debt, the present value of financial distress cost is minimal. As more and more debt is added, the present value of this cost rises at an increasing rate, implying a reduction in firm value from further leverage. Next, we are going to learn about how the integration of tax effects and financial distress costs affect the cost of equity. The line RS is upsloping. At low debt to equity level, the slope is flatter. However, the slope of the line is steeper when debt to equity ratio is high. This is due to financial distress costs. What about weighted average cost of capital? From the figure, the WACC is represented by the red line. What kind of relation do you observe? Weighted average cost of capital falls initially because of the tax advantage of debt. Beyond point B asterisk, the weighted average cost of capital begins to rise because of financial distress costs. There are three types of financial distress costs. These costs make debt less attractive. Direct costs refer to the legal and administration costs of liquidation or reorganization. Lawyers are involved throughout all the stages before and during bankruptcy. For example, 
Lehman Brother bankruptcy in September 2008 was the largest ever bankruptcy concern one of the biggest banks in the world. This bankruptcy followed large write downs on subprime mortgage assets and general collapse in the interbank credit. Estimates vary on the total cost of the bank's collapse, but a conservative estimate is around $2 billion, and it is very likely to be much higher. According to Lehman Brothers' official documentation, the total fees that were paid to administrators, lawyers, and other parties amounted to $1 billion within just two years of the bankruptcy. Researchers have reported a wide range of direct costs of financial distress, from 3% of the market value of the firm to 20 and 25% for smaller firms. Indirect cost refers to the impaired ability to conduct business. Bankruptcy hampers conducts with customers and suppliers. Sales are frequently lost because of both fear of impaired service and loss of trust. When a firm has debt, conflicts of interest arise between shareholders and bondholders. The conflicts can be magnified when financial distress is incurred, impose agency costs on the firm. Because of this, shareholders are tempted to pursue selfish strategies. The selfish strategies by shareholders are costly because they will lower the market value of the entire firm. There are three kinds of selfish strategies. We will learn further in the next few slides. Firms near bankruptcy often take greater chances because they believe that they are playing with someone else's money. This means shareholders will select high-risk projects even though the net present value is lower. Shareholders expropriate value from the bondholders by selecting high-risk projects. They are tempted to take larger risks since they have nothing to lose when financial distress has already incurred. Shareholders have residual claims on the assets of the firm. Incentive towards underinvestment happens because shareholders of a firm with a significant probability of bankruptcy often find that new investment helps the bondholders at the shareholders' expense. Therefore, shareholders will not use their own funds to improve the value of a business that faces imminent bankruptcy and will soon be reprocessed. The third selfish investment strategy is known as milking the property, which is a phrase taken from real estate. In such a case, shareholders pay out extra dividends or other distributions in times of financial distress, leaving less in the firm for the bondholders. This is worse than underinvestment. In the second selfish strategy of underinvestment, the firm chooses not to raise new equity. Strategy 3 goes one step further because equity is actually withdrawn through the dividend. Let's sum up what we have learned so far. It is important to note that corporate leverage decision involves a trade-off between tax subsidy and financial distress costs. The higher the leverage, the higher the benefit from tax yield, but the higher the disadvantages of financial distress cost too. Therefore, the firm's capital structure is optimized when the marginal subsidy to debt equals the marginal cost. A finance manager should understand this and try to strike a balance between debt and equity financing. Finally, we have come to the end of the presentation on capital structure. To recap, 
there are three scenarios that we have covered. First, a perfect market with no tax. Second, a world with tax. And third, a world with tax and financial distress costs. I'm sure you understand what this figure means and what is represented by the three lines, right? Well, if not, you can always watch the videos again. Finally, we have come to the end of this video. I hope you have benefited from the presentation and content in this video. If you like this video, please click like, subscribe or share. Thank you. See you and goodbye.